Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to talk about the environmental uh, reviews that were conducted within the GRACE project, uh, looking at the impacts of uh, GM crops on the environment. Um, we conducted six reviews. Uh, hang on, which is the advance, this one? No. Yes, that's it, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, we, um, we, we conducted uh, six reviews and the, the rationale for this was that um, <clears throat> BT and HT crops have been widely grown now in many parts of the world um, for several years uh, and uh, a lot of data has accumulated on them, both from the real world experiences of the cultivation as well as from experimental studies. And um, it was felt that there would be sufficient data to carry out systematic reviews of um, the available information from these crops. Um, and we um, felt that this was useful because it would provide an update of what the status was of knowledge on these crops for people who were interested, stakeholders, uh, decision makers, etc. <clears throat> And to actually pin down, <coughs> excuse me, to focus on the questions, um, we involved the stakeholders. In fact, stakeholders were involved all the way through the whole process. But initially, stakeholders were asked to give their opinions on what they thought were the most relevant questions to address to BT crops and to HT crops. And they were involved in the prioritisation of the questions which became the focus of the systematic reviews. And um, this was done through a series of negotiations and, and discussions with, with them. <clears throat> we produced uh, six uh, review protocols uh, based on these questions, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, these uh, protocols were peer reviewed and were published in CEE and um, uh, in environmental evidence. And um, uh, obviously they're available. Uh, if you want to get the references for them, I can provide them. <clears throat> So the first questions uh, that were raised were these ones. Uh, they're all on the BT crops and on non-target organisms. So there were three questions and they followed uh, what's known as the PICO formula uh, for designing questions for systematic reviews. So the I is the intervention. So the intervention is the BT maze, the intervention in the, in the field or the environmental exposure is the BT maze. Uh, we were looking at the effect on populations so the outcome was a change in a population of a non-target organism. Um, and uh, the, the, the outcome uh, was obviously the, the scale of that change. And that's how we formulated the, the PICO questions. And you can see there the review teams that were involved. And if you want details of the outcomes, uh, please ask them, because I can only very briefly <laughs> run through them uh, in, in this uh, report. So, for example, looking at um, BT maize impacts on uh, non-target uh, animals, the sorts of data that were generated were these. In all of them, obviously, these were, I should have said that the other was the C in PICO is uh, comparative. There, there always has to be a comparative basis in the question. So the question is always, uh, what is the effect of the, the GM crop compared with a comparator, which is normally the conventional? So here, um, in fact, we had, we had two conventionals that, that, that were used in the comparison. Um, the first conventional here uh, is comparing with untreated uh, BT maize. And so this is looking at the CRY1 types for Lepidoptera control and the CRY3 types for Coleoptera control. And here comparing with conventional. And what you can see is the effect sizes change from uh, plus or minus uh, from zero. Um, of, of the effect of the intervention with BT. So a negative effect size um, is, uh, is showing an effect of BT. A positive effect size is showing the effect of the conventional. <clears throat> and here you can see um, that in both cases, comparing with, with um, conventional, there's a fairly close uh, cluster of the BT effects uh, to the conventional. Here you have one effect showing. Uh, the numbers were the number of studies that we used to uh, make these calculations. 
However, the other baseline that was used uh, in C and D is uh, the use of insecticides on the conventional crop. So that here you have uh, CRY1 types compared uh, with conventional crops, and uh, sorry, with uh, treated conventional crops. And here you have CRY3 types compared with um, conventional treated crops. And you can see there is a change um, here um, in, in that um, the response of some species is, or types of insects is, is changing um, depending on what the comparator is. And so often what you can see is, is that the, the BT is actually coming out with some sort of intermediate effect between the effect on the conventional and the effect on, 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 of the um, insecticide usage. But is it, is it interesting how some of these uh, responses are occurring in relation particularly to the insecticide treatments uh, and not so visible in response purely to the, the BT treatments. So these were the sorts of data that were collected and, and, and were analysed. If you wish to ask more questions about this one, obviously ask uh, Michael and Diogo who are in the audience. But the sort of outcomes that they, they reported were that in, in most cases there were no effects when populations of target invertebrates uh, inhabiting untreated BT maize were compared with those um, in, sorry, yeah, in untreated BT maize were compared with conventional untreated crops. Um, whereas when you compared um, the broad spectrum insecticides, um, then you did see some effects uh, on invertebrates compared with the BT maize. So there were some uh, differences which showed up in these studies. I don't know what's happened there. Okay. Um, and these results uh, mainly confirm the results of earlier meta-analyses that have been conducted. So there have been some meta-analyses conducted by teams in the USA um, a few years back. Um, and these are basically adding to that database and that information. If we move on to the um, BT crops and soil invertebrates, uh, then the sort of distribution of effects that were found uh, were this. Um, you can see here we had a total of th 31 studies that were done, um, which involved more than 600 observations of impacts on soil invertebrates. And you get a nice uh, normal distribution effect around the zero uh, for hedges G, this is the effect size. <clears throat> and so the um, conclusion that was come to here was that uh, no significant effects of BT crops on soil invertebrates were, were, were found, uh, no effects on individually selected, of individually selected types of cry protein. So there was no instance when a particular cry protein seemed to be having an effect, and there seemed to be no effect on particular taxonomic orders. Um, but again, if you want more information on that, talk to Paul uh, Crow and his, his colleagues. Then in relation to BT crops and the soil microbial endpoints, uh, you have here a list of, uh, there were 19 studies that were, were revealed in the, in the review, uh, 370 observations. Um, and this was looking at a number of different microbial endpoints because obviously there are lots of different ways of measuring uh, microbial uh, populations in, in soil. Um, but here, um, this is grouping together the microbial endpoints that we used. What you can see, <clears throat> again, is a, a clustering of the effects pretty close to the zero mark. Um, and when you take an overall um, average, uh, you come to 0 0.9. Um, so, so, sorry, 0 0.09, so very little effect. There are one or two outliers uh, here. And, um, uh, and, and so, obviously, there were some occasional studies which seemed to show some effects on some species. <clears throat> But um, based on the uh, data extracted and analysed, uh, BT crops do not change microbial endpoints as compared with conventional crops. Um, but they may have some minor short-term effects, and I think some of those outliers were showing those minor short-term effects, but the effects appear to have little or no func functional significance. So though you may get some short-term effects on soil microbial populations, um, th th they, they don't reveal themselves in the longer term and they don't seem to have any effect on soil functioning. But again, if you want inf more information on that, uh, talk to uh, Niels and he will bring you up to date. <clears throat> 
So the, 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 the next uh, rev two reviews that were done were done by colleagues at, um, uh, at BVL. And this was looking at um, the interaction between the BT crops and the target organisms. The previous studies were looking at non-targets. This was looking at the target organisms. And what we wanted to know here was how susceptible are different Lepidopteran and Coleopteran maize pests? And what evidence is there uh, of resistance alleles in populations of Lepidopteran and Coleopteran maize pests? So if you remember the, that maize um, is, is being developed expressing CRY1 types for uh, Lepidoptera control and CRY3 types for, for, for Coleopteran control for rootworm. Um, and <clears throat> there's now been a, a history of use of these for some time and we wanted to know what data that was available on, on the sensitivity and the resistance development in these populations. So the sort of data that was accumulated, for example, on the susceptibility with, with the corn borer, uh, you can see a small data set here. Um, and this was related to artificial diet assays fed on the surface. And so you can see here for CRY1AB, there were quite a lot of tests that have been done and actually a very big range in LC50, which is quite interesting. And if you want more information on that, please talk to Akim and Kai. Uh, for CRY1AC, uh, there was less data and uh, a narrower range of, of sensitivity uh, was found. And for CRY1F, uh, intermediate amount of data um, and again a, a range that was shown uh, with a higher minimum uh, sensitivity there, which is what we expect from the data that was supplied originally with CRY1F types. But interesting data sets and, and, and <clears throat> basically... Um, you know, confirming a lot of the previous data. Uh, unfortunately, most of the data that was available in this study of sensitivity related to Helicoverpa, the, the, the army worm, which is only really a minor pest occasionally in parts of southern Europe. Maybe that will change with uh, climate change. Um, but anyway, it still provides a very important data resource um, and uh, valuable information um, on, on some of these species. Um, there were some limitations in this study because it was difficult to actually get hold of some of the data uh, that was available from the companies in relation to applications and, and monitoring. Um, there have been ongoing discussions with Europa Bio and, and the companies about getting hold of that data. So maybe that problem will be solved in future. But it does give, I think, a over, good overview of the range of sensitivities of, of these species, which um, you know, provides a useful database. And then looking at um, inheritance of resistance, um, again, rather limited data available on this. Most of this, again, was related to army worm studies um, uh, and, and um, uh, rather of, of limited relevance to BT maize. Um, but there, there were some data sets showing um, re resistance evolution. And I can show you one uh, data, some data here. Um, first of all, with uh, Diabrotica, uh, the root worm uh, to cry three. There was a data set here um, describing the, the non-recessive uh, nature of the resistance. Uh, with the Lepidoptera, you've got some um, studies of corn borer. Um, here, some studies uh, showing the recessive uh, nature. And with um, Ithymna, um, again, showing that it's a partly a dominant um, resistance to the cry 1AB. And then, of course, here with um, Helicoverpa, uh, quite a large data set, particularly coming from cotton, where it's a major pest, <coughs> showing um, the, the variable nature of the resistance development to, to both CRY1 and CRY2. <coughs> right. Um, then um, <coughs> the, the final review uh, that was done was looking at the impact of the changes in crop management um, particularly in relation to herbicide tolerant crops. And the question here was, are plant populations in GMHT crops changed or different from those occurring in conventional crops with conventional herbicide management? And the, the thinking behind this was obviously this concern that had been raised by a lot of people that we already have a problem with biodiversity in farmland and that if we move over to using herbicide tolerant crops, we will reduce it even further because of the effectiveness of the, uh, the herbicide programs. So we were looking at weed populations. 
um, and we looked at, at weed populations under a whole range of different conditions and looking at different weeds. So we particularly focused on looking at the monocotyledonous weeds and the dicotyledonous weeds because they tend to have different responses to different herbicides. And we looked in six different crops, uh, which have been fairly widely grown as herbicide tolerant crops throughout the world. Um, what, what we found was obviously that the, the response of weeds depended very much on the herbicide programs that were used. And so what we have done is started to break down the data to try and determine what the differential effects are of the different herbicide treatments. And this is an example of a data set for cotton where we've started to do this. And so down here you have all the different combinations, uh, first of all, of the herbicide tolerant programs uh, with glyphosate and then comparing them with uh, a number of conventional programs with pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides. What we found with, with the studies of the glyphosate tolerant crops in particular was that initially many of the uh, um, glyphosate tolerant crops were grown only with glyphosate as the herbicide used. And then gradually over a number of years farmers started to use um, other, other herbicides. And there are a number of reasons for, for, for that. So that what we found was that in the data sets that we were looking at, that there were changes and there were shifts in the, the way the, the weed populations were responding, depending on the type of herbicide programs that were being used. And so we had this breakdown here, ranging from one glyphosate on its own up to three glyphosates. And then here, combinations of pre-emergent uh, traditional herbicides, if you like, with glyphosate. Um, and here, uh, glyphosate with other post-emergent herbicides. So a whole range of different combinations of, of, of the usage of glyphosate with different herbicides. If you, you can actually see some slight uh, trends here, particularly if you use your imagination. For example, <laughs> you, can, you can see uh, that, that sometimes the effect size is uh, greater when you have three glyphosates as compared with two or one. Um, so you can see the additional effect that the um, treatments can, can have. But overall, if you look at the effect of uh, the overall uh, glyphosate treatments that we used, uh, all the different combinations, and then compare them with uh, the c conventional treatments overall, not, not a huge difference. Um, and that was tended to be the trend all the way through these, these studies. <clears throat> so just briefly looking at the overall conclusions that we can draw from this. The effects on the weed populations depended on the crop. Uh, the different herbicide programs that were compared, the weed species and types, and a range of other management factors such as, as timing, frequency, rates, dosage, etc. Um, <clears throat> what we found was that the, the herbicide tolerant treatments were more effective on grass weeds in maize, and that's because if you think about it, selective herbicides don't, for, for grass weeds are not so effective in a graminaceous crop. And also we found, obviously, that the HT treatments were more effective on broadleaf weeds in the broadleaf crops, again, because you have less selective herbicides that you can use. We found overall that glyphosate treatments um, were producing weed populations less uh, than those in the conventional. But when you look at the variations that are involved in that calculation, you'll see that there's a huge amount of variability. And obviously it depends very much on the herbicide programs that are used. And there were some conventional herbicide programs which would always give a, as good or, or better control than glyphosate. So you have a whole spectrum of different activities. <clears throat> we also looked obviously at glufosinate treatments and what we found with glufosinate was a much more variable response. It's not such a powerful herbicide and therefore the um, effects of glufosinate were much more variable and, and less, less predicted. So just coming back to what we thought about the reviews overall, um, we had the stakeholder involvement all the way through, which I think was helpful in, in prioritising uh, the, the questions that we had in the first place, and then how we actually conducted the reviews. Um, we had a, a stakeholder meeting fairly recently in Vienna, and we had a good feedback on, on how we're beginning to interpret these reviews and, and, and the, the outcomes of them. Uh, they are a very comprehensive approach, um, as you'll see if you get around to reading the protocols. Um, and uh, they have uh, allowed us to make multiple databases and to look at a whole range of different interactions. 
um, at, at different levels. And, and I think that helps us to have a better understanding, um, not just of the sort of overall effects that we're picking up, but some of the details. Some, some of the, we, can, we can now, I think, explain some of the effects better because of the database that we have. Um, we, we look quite critically at the quality of the studies uh, that, that came in, though I must say, I think in most of the final analyses, we tended to put most of the studies in where we felt that we could use them. Um, but I think um, what, what it means is that I think the critical appraisal has helped us to better understand the factors which can often limit or influence studies and their outcomes. Um, and we're hoping that that will become part of our report and we can comment on, on that. And the other thing is, of course, is, is that it was hopefully a, an open process um, and allowed people to scrutinise exactly what we were doing. It was fairly, it was uh, transparent and hopefully the, the outcomes and, and the conclusions that we reach will be um, transparent to people as well so that they can understand how we reach those conclusions. Um, we did have problems, obviously, with studies like this. There were, there were problems at accessing the grey literature in, in some areas, particularly for the herbicide tolerance data. Um, and we had problems accessing some of the, the regulatory uh, documents because of confidentiality uh, access problems. Um, there's a lot of variability um, in, in these studies, um, and, and which comes through in the meta-analysis. And so therefore, it's going to be quite tricky really coming to statistical conclusions on some of the findings. Um, but we still have discussions ongoing on, on how we're going to do the analyses of, of some of this. Um, there was unequal availability of data for different species. There are, if you like, pet species that some people tend to study. And there are other species which are difficult for people to study and therefore very little data on them. And that doesn't necessarily reflect the importance of those species. It's often the fact that they are difficult to culture, they're difficult to study, they're difficult to observe, etc. So, um, and, and another problem is, is really there's no way to, we, we didn't develop a way to standardise the criteria for the quality assessment. Um, though we, we did have some good discussions, I think, on... on, on quality assessment, um, but I, and I think we can make some comments on, on how that feeds through into the reviews. So our, our, our feelings on this was that it, it's a useful um, for a comprehensive and transparent evidence synthesis. It provides useful information for, for decision makers, stakeholders, other people who are interested in, 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 in getting the information. Um, hopefully it increases public trust in that people can look critically at what we have done and interrogate us and, and, and pull us apart and so on and hopefully um, they can see how we came to the, the, the conclusions. The systematic reviews I think were very um, useful to conduct when there is sufficient data available um, and when the reports come out you will see that in some areas uh, there was not sufficient data and so we have not been able to complete systematic reviews or any form of meta-analysis um, because there was too limited data. Obviously, um, as has been said, this is not risk assessment. You can't use it to say, is a crop safe or is a, an event safe? But what it does do is it provides you answers to specific questions in relation to events and, and GM crops. And, and hopefully that's what we tried to do. Um, but obviously, um, as someone raised, it's a very expensive and, and um, time-consuming process um, and um, not to be recommended for people who don't have deep pockets. So, from a scientific point of view, our results um, confirm the conclusions of previous risk assessments on these crops. There's certainly no evidence which raises uh, serious questions about the, the, the um, GM, and, um, BT and HT crops, which have, have already been misassessed. But what they do do is they provide additional information on, on why we can perhaps have a bit more confidence on the safety of, of these, these crops to inform um, managers and, and other people. And they all add to, to the, the weight of information uh, which goes through in, in supporting those particular crops. Um, and, and to a certain extent can be helpful perhaps in when you're looking at new events but which are very closely related to the ones which have already been produced before in that you have this big 
a bulk of information behind you so that you, you can use that as a starting point for uh, look at looking at new events. So um, just to finalise, I would like to thank um, everybody in Work Package 5. Uh, it's been a great team to work with. Um, I should perhaps put in the parts tense because we still have quite a lot to do to finish off the reports. Um, so um, we, still, we, we and uh, so hopefully we'll have another month of useful collaboration in trying to to um, finalise um, the the reviews and, and get the uh, reports written up. And then we have the even harder task of trying to get the papers written and submitted uh, to the Environmental Evidence Journal, which is hopefully the final product of of all of these reviews. Uh, and also I would like to thank the support of all the other people in, in GRACE and also the stakeholders um, who have um, supported us and helped us all the way through in this process. So thank you very much.